Good afternoon. Thank you for joining Family Caregiver Alliance for Challenges of Aging and Caregiving in the LGBT Community, a guide for providers and professionals. My name is Calvin Hu and I'm the Education Coordinator at FCA and your host. For nearly 40 years, Family Caregiver Alliance has been working through the Bay Area and across the nation to improve the well-being of family caregivers. We offer support through classes, workshops, publications, retreats, support services, research, and advocacy. If you'd like to learn more about us, you can visit us at www.caregiver.org. So for the duration of the presentation, your phones and your microphones are going to be muted. If you have any questions, you can ask them by going to the GoToWebinar question box on your screen, and we'll get to as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. At the completion of the webinar, you'll also be asked to give some feedback, and we use this for shaping future education programs, so I'd like to thank you in advance for filling those out. We always love to hear from you. So today I'd like to welcome Sylvia Vargas from Open House, who is our guest for this month's webinar. And uh, this month is also, of course, National Family Caregivers Month. So Sylvia relocated to the Bay Area in 2011 to be closer to family, uh, but also to finish a degree in social work. Uh, during that time, when she was a full-time student, she also volunteered at uh, Meals on Wheels, uh, Institute on Aging's Friendship Line, which is a um, counseling line for seniors who are considering uh, suicide, uh, and also Open House. So Sylvia is dedicated to advocating for and working with diverse populations, uh, in particular the aging and capable LGBTQ community. Uh, at Open House, Sylvia is the caring, uh, sorry, the caring connections friendly visitor program manager. So what she does is she'll recruit, screen, and train volunteers who want to give back to this um, LGBT older adult community, kind of the people who went before them there. Their, um, their elders. So Sylvia will uh, match these volunteers with uh, isolated LGBT seniors and the idea is that they get ongoing companionship and emotional support. Um, so Sylvia will talk a little bit more uh, in the PowerPoint why this is something that's particularly important to the, uh, the LGBT community. Um, otherwise, Sylvia moderates the LGBT Caring Community Online Support Group which is actually a partnership between Family Caregiver Alliance and Open House. And you can visit our website if you'd like to learn a little bit more information about that group. So now that you know a little bit more about our guest, I'd like to turn things over to Sylvia. Thank you so much, Calvin. Thank you for ask, asking me to participate today, especially in light of it being National Family Caregivers Month. Important work being done by caregivers. Um, that's correct, I am the Open House Friendly Visitor Program Manager. Uh, very happy to do this type of work. Um, I meet volunteers who comment that they just get so much out of the Friendly Visitor Program as much as the LGBT seniors who are also involved in the program. Um, I work with volunteers and seniors in creating Friendly Visitor matches, helping to reduce isolation, provide socialization, some of the outings that our volunteers may um, volunteers and seniors may participate in is maybe going to a movie, maybe going to a museum, maybe just going for a walk. For many of our LGBT seniors, these types of activities they're not able to do on their own anymore. They might have mobility issues. They might be fearful of, you know, going out and about in a hustling and bustling city, especially in San Francisco. I receive referrals from medical providers, social workers, community members or LGBT elders may self-refer. I might get a call from a social worker who thinks that maybe they might have a client who might be from the LGBT community. And so we work together to kind of safely navigate them to help them to be able to communicate with their client on what types of services that Open House has and that they might benefit from them. My hope today is to maybe provide some information about the unique challenges of LGBT aging and LGBT caregiving. I want to talk a little bit more about Open House and a little bit of its history and just some of the services and programs that we provide. So we were founded in 1998 and Open House is essentially committed to providing housing, assistance in finding housing, social services, 
such as case management. We're recognized as one of 26 adult disability resource centers in San Francisco. We help to connect seniors with services such as applying for paratransit, help with their clipper card, help with meal programs, and also help with rental subsidies in a, in a city that can be very challenging, especially when seniors are on a fixed or limited income. We offer community programs to LGBT seniors so that they can age with security, dignity, and grace in the community of their choice. We also partner with service providers such as FCA and organizations to provide training on LGBT related issues. Our training program helps service providers and staff become allies and advocates of LGBT seniors. One of our primary goals is to reduce isolation by connecting LGBT seniors to available services and sustaining their ability to live independently. Some of the ways we work to help reduce isolation is by offering hundreds of LGBT affirming programs that may include health and wellness workshops. We have a men's HIV support group, a men's drop-in group, transgender support groups, a women's support group. We have monthly discussion groups, language classes, culture events, and much, much more. We've also been started to include support groups for caregivers of loved ones going through the challenges of dementia and other illnesses. What I'd like to do is just kind of talk a little bit about aging concerns for seniors in general. One of my clients told me recently that aging is not for the faint of heart. Aging always comes with challenges, but for LGBT individuals and the people who care for them, the transition into older age can be especially daunting. I'd like to highlight and discuss some of the overarching concerns that both non-LGBT and LGBT seniors may share with regards to financial security, health care, autonomy, social support, and community. Many elders worry about finances. Will I outlive my income? When it comes to health care, many elders are concerned of being able to have access to affordable health care. When it comes to autonomy, elders worry about being able to maintain their independence and remain in their home. For social support and a sense of community, elders will often express, will I have the love and support of family and friends? Will I be able to stay connected to my community or church? I have an elder aunt right now who we shared a conversation one day and she was just expressing uh, over time the loss of many of her friends, the loss of her siblings. She lost her husband almost 20 years ago and the impact on her life that these losses had on her. Elders also feel this, the loss of social support can affect elders, creating risks of social isolation and other possible health issues. Next what I'd like to do is to focus a little bit on aging concerns as it pertains to LGBT seniors. The concerns are the same, but it's really important uh, to recognize how prejudices and discrimination have impacted these areas for LGBT seniors. Many LGBT elders faced job discrimination, barriers to upward mobility, fired from jobs. This affected their long-term financial stability. Many were not able to legally marry and have the benefits of being in a, in a, in a two-household income or a committed legal married relationship and all the benefits that can come from that. Many of our long-term survivors who survived the HIV AIDS epidemic often lack financial security. I often hear, I didn't think I'd live this long. When it comes to health care, the same concerns, will I have access to affordable care? But in addition, LD, LG, LGBT elders may be afraid to utilize services due to previous discrimination and mistrust of service providers. Fears of insensitive and 
discriminatory treatment by providers. They may be afraid to disclose their sexual orientation or gender identity and often are less likely to seek treatment until things might worsen and then having to resort to visiting an emergency room for care. That in itself can be traumatic for anyone. When it comes to autonomy, will I be able to remain independent, stay in my home, continue to afford my home? Today about 80% of long-term care is provided by family. LGBT elders are more likely to be single, childless, and rely on friends and community for support. As with non-LGBT seniors, social, su social support and a sense of community is a concern. For LGBT seniors, the challenges to maintain strong social networks is difficult. Many have experienced loss of friends. Many feel left out of the LGBT community, especially elders of color and transgender elders. They experience ageism within the LGBT community. Elders often will describe feeling invisible within the community. Many elders lost countless friends during the HIV AIDS crisis and the few that are remaining may also be passing away or having chronic health issues at this time. What I'd like to do is just go over some definitions for some commonly used terms. Many have probably heard these before. Um, the first is sexual orientation, which is a scientific term for an individual's enduring, physical, romantic, and or emotional attraction to members of the same and or opposite sex. Now it's important to avoid sexual preference, which suggests that being gay or lesbian is voluntary and therefore curable. Gender identity, one's internal personal sense of being a man or a woman, boy or girl. For transgender people, their birth assigned sex and their own internal sense of gender identity do not match. Homophobia, fear of lesbians and gay men. Biphobia is fear of bisexual people. Transphobia, fear of transgender people and other gender variant people. What does it mean to say openly gay or out? Really just that self-identifying as lesbian or gay in their public or professional lives openly bisexual, could be openly transgender. Heterosexism assumes everyone is heterosexual and a term that applies to negative attitudes, bias and discrimination in favor of opposite sex sexuality and relationships. Family of origin, family of choice. For LGBT folks, many include both. When we talk about origin, we generally mean biological, children, siblings, grandparents, cousins, aunts, uncles. Family of choice, we generally mean friends, neighbors, those that we hold close that may not be biologically related. I'd like to point out though that it's it's really important to recognize that in the LGBT community we don't necessarily use the phrase family of choice and instead just say family. So it's important for agencies and providers to recognize how the LGBT community describes family and to honor and respect that. I just wanted to take a few moments to address some of these important terms and language when discussing LGBT issues. Next I'd like to just provide some LGBT facts regarding the community and especially LGBT aging community. So it's estimated that there are about 1.6 million LGBT elders in the United States. And it's estimated that it's going to be about 3 million by 2030. There's about 25,000 LGBT folks over 60 in San Francisco. LGBT seniors are twice as likely to be single, four times more likely not to have children, Three quarters of gay men aged 65 to 74 are without a partner. In, in 2013, the San Francisco LGBT Aging Policy Task Force conducted a community survey of older LGBT adults in San Francisco, and I just wanted to share some of the findings. 
Nearly 60% live alone. 40% do not have the income to meet their basic needs. Only 15% have children. 63% are neither partnered or married. 40% have one or more disabilities. 33% are men, of men are living with HIV AIDS. And 15% have considered taking their life. Some additional background LGBT facts I want to discuss really is around the idea, and it's something to consider, is that all of us need information. We all need resources. We all need assistance as we age. How do, how do we apply for services? How do we apply for meal programs and transportation, in-home support services? This in itself can be stressful, especially when you don't have the help that you might need. When it comes to older LGBT adults, they have generally fewer social and familial supports, less financial security than their heterosexual peers, and are at risk of social isolation, reduced mental and physical help, homophobia, ageism, elder abuse, cognitive impairment, and premature death. When we discuss minority stress, what we know that it has increased social isolation in LGBT older adults. It's chronic and it's related to LGBT stigmatization and experiences of discrimination and violence. Many elders choose to remain closeted and avoid accessing services like going to senior centers or meal programs and some of the other entitlements which result in increasing vulnerability and risks. Or they'll just hide their sexual orientation when they're out, creating even more isolation. LGBT elders generally lack traditional caregiver support and advocacy. They're most likely to rely on various friends and neighbors who may not have the ability to advocate for the LGBT senior or the time. I've had community members express that how they caregive for one another and they may call it a different name than caregive just really how they support one another is that a group of five friends may all take part in support of that of their close friend whether one person goes shopping one person might pick up their prescriptions one person might take them out to dinner or come maybe help them out with their home so it's a collective effort but oftentimes they're only able to support so many hours so that elder may not get that consistent advocacy that they might need Often, the support is less likely to be intergenerational. Friends are generally the same age, the same cohort, and they also might be experiencing aging and health challenges. They rely on friends and partners who may lack any legal recognition. It can present a lot of challenges. One example would be for Family Medical Leave Act. It doesn't necessarily provide medical leave for a person who wishes to take care of a friend or an unmarried person. LGBT elders are more reliant on community-based programs for socialization. Often, LGBT older adults will hide their sexual orientation at senior centers and senior residences for fear of being discriminated against. It's not unusual to hear service providers comment and say, well, I don't think that we have LGBT folks that live here. Oftentimes, Elders will not put out pictures in their bedrooms. They don't feel safe. They won't be open about their sexuality. They'll hide it. This is at a time when seniors should be enjoying themselves. They worked hard, but often they're retreating back into the closet. A recent study found that uh, about 33% of gay and lesbian older adults thought they would have to hide their sexual identity if they moved into senior housing. I'd like to provide a little bit of historical context um, in regards to LGBT elders and some of their lived experiences. Today, LGBT seniors, today's LGBT seniors, that is, came of age at a time when there was great mis misunderstanding and prejudice against them. 
They can be fired, arrested, sent to a psychiatric hospital, or worse, for loving someone of the same sex, or for not conforming to gender standards. Their emotional and physical safety were always at risk. Homosexuality was considered a psychiatric disorder until 1973, and that's when the American Psychological Association removed it from its diagnostic and statistical manual, under, under, which was located under mental disorder. Homosexuality was considered criminal in many states until 2003. Elders came of an age in a very different time. Many led secret lives or were married and had children to fit in. I've had, I've had conversations with community members who describe if you were male and you didn't get married and you didn't have children, it could affect your job. You could be fired. People would look at you differently. So they often just chose to stay in the closet and hide that part of themselves. We talk about the different cohorts and the different generations. We talk about the silent generation who basically came of age of the four, in their 40s, in the 1940s and the 1950s. And then we talk about the baby boomers who generally came of age in the 1960s and the 1970s. We have many who lived through the HIV AIDS crisis, who were shunned by society, by family, left alone often to die alone. We have stories of community members who have shared that often it was the lesbian community who would come to the aid of many of the gay men who were stricken with the illness or often dying. And many of these men experience what we call survivor's guilt. They lost so many friends. I have community members that will just say, yeah, I lost 30 of my closest friends. I lost 40 of my dearest friends. The history of discrimination and intolerance has left many elders just continuing to hide as a way to survive. Many of them continue to hide at such a great cost to their physical, emotional, social, and spiritual well-being. LGBT baby boomers are more vocal. They came of age during a period of activism, social movements, but no less worried about the kind of care that they can expect in the years ahead. I just want to talk about some caregiving challenges with seniors, overarching challenges with seniors in general. Recently, um, AARP came out with an article that reports 40 million people identify as caregivers. And it's estimated that 37 billion hours of unpaid caregiving is worth around $470 billion. That's huge. We know there's been an increase in the aging population and elders over 85, with the majority of care being provided by informal caregivers, family members, friends, and neighbors. Caring for seniors, family members, friends is even more complicated, with many caregivers performing medical tasks that were formerly done by medical professionals and nurses, such as injecting medicines or inserting catheters. Hospitals are discharging patients quickly in order to cut costs. With the longevity of seniors, caregivers may be managing chronic conditions for five or ten years. I also want to talk a little bit about caregiving challenges with LGBT seniors. But I'd like to also uh, just suggest it's important to highlight that historical prejudice against LGBT elders has severely impacted, it's disrupted their lives, their connections to family, their chances maybe to have and raise children, and their opportunities to earn a living and save for retirement. The stigma continues to stand in the way of full participa par participation in community and full and equal access to maybe health and community services, senior programs, and just opportunities later in life. LGBT elders encounter distinct obstacles. Um, we know that they fear outside care, often fear outside caregivers and social service and health providers. 
generally because of past experiences of discrimination and harm. According to FCA, um, 50% of the LGBT community receiving in-home or institutional care have reported discrimination or harassment from, from their caregivers. Discrimination in healthcare and long-term settings. Um, caregivers and care receivers, again, they live through historic, historical periods of hostility and discrimination, and they, may be, they fear they may be subjected to it again when they seek services and support. Other challenges are related to limited access to services. Because LGBT seniors, they fear judgment, rejection, or even compromised care if they come out, they all too often don't access the information and care they need. And they don't disclose information that might be helpful to medical providers when planning their care. No legal protection for partners and other loved ones. Really, unless detailed, extensive legal planning is done in advance, LGBT caregivers and care recipients Wishes and decisions may not be recognized, especially if it conflicts with, say, their biological family. We know that there's about 50 to 60 percent of LGBT elders who do not have wills or durable power of attorneys or advanced directives. Now I just wanted to talk a little bit about some challenges of being an LGBT caregiver. We know caregivers are generally family members and friends. We know that they're the primary caregivers in this country. Not a great deal of attention, though, has been given to LGBT caregiving and LGBT caregivers. I think that there are some assumptions made that LGBT caregivers do not care for families. However, family members may expect more from LGBT individuals because of assumptions that they might, be, they might have less responsibility, even if they're partnered and even if they have children. So they are often chosen as the caregiver for family of origin. LGBT caregivers have a history of disadvantage, marginalization, and invisibility that they carry from their own lived experiences. They may also perceive that barriers related to sexual orientation and they might be reluctant to seek outside support especially maybe around finding respite. You know, who do they turn to? How do they share what's going on with them without having to self-disclose? That could be really, really frightening for someone. They encounter obstacles in securing support, including discrimination in healthcare and long-term care settings. This can be compounded if the caregiver is LGBT, of a different ethnicity, or maybe physically challenged. Having limited access to services, especially in smaller cities and rural areas. I know here in San Francisco, there are lots of services, but even with lots of services, we do still have folks that are really fearful of accessing those services. So I can only imagine what it could be like in some of these rural areas where there are fewer LGBT-friendly resources for caregivers. The lack of legal protection for their partners and other loved ones. Unsupportive workplaces come to mind. And they may not recognize caregiving relationships and caregiving responsibilities, which also can increase caregiver stress. And providers may not recognize the role of caregiver and the family of their, cho their, and their chosen family, of course. How can we create a safe and welcoming environment? I just want to share a little bit, just even from my own experience, and just that LGBT folks will scan for safety, and they will scan for welcoming space. I do it, and I've done it since I came out. It's something we get used to doing. There are different ways that we can go about creating safe and welcoming environments, setting a tone of respect, sending an inclusive message, the use of sensitive language. This can also include practicing cultural humility, which really just emphasizes a commitment to lifelong learning. We know that cultural humility sees individuals and communities that have been oppressed as just really rich sources of expertise. 
and really teachers on the content of culture, cultures that we don't know, that are different from our own. It's important to practice active listening, develop self-awareness and just being respectful towards differences and embracing those differences. Talking about setting a tone of respect, um, we know recent studies have reported that less than 50% of baby boomers expect healthcare professionals would treat them with dignity and respect. 12% of lesbians have absolutely no confidence that they will be treated respectfully. Creating a culture of respect for diversity begins with client intake and also staff hiring. You know, don't assume heterosexuality even when you know the client is married or has children or grandchildren. Many LGBT people from earlier generations got married, they had children, and maybe they came out later in life. You know, don't assume that homophobia and transphobia affect only LGBT clients. Your clients or your residents, they may have children, they may have grandchildren and other relatives or friends who are LGBT. They may not want to talk about their LGBT loved ones because they may not want to hear or have to defend themselves against negative comments. Sending an inclusive message. We know about 50%, at least we know with Open House and some of our surveys, about 50% of LGBT seniors don't access the internet. And they may not know that your organization is welcoming. So it's really important to spell it out on your materials. Include sexual orientation and gender identity in your non-discrimination statement. Maybe print it on an intake form or other materials. Print it and post it in public. Public areas such as maybe lobbies, waiting rooms, offices, and also on your organization's website. A sample of a non-discrimination statement might look like the following. <clears throat> organization name, is committed to serving all seniors, regardless of race, ethnicity, sex, age, religion, national origin, mental or physical ability, sexual orientation, gender identity, ancestry, military discharge status, marital status, source of income, housing status, or other protected classification. Just honoring all. The use of sensitive language and how might that look like. With all clients, use of language does, that does not implicitly assume the client's sexual orientation or gender identity. This will send a message that it's safe for a client or resident to talk to you about his or her sexual orientation or gender identity. They may not always do it up front. It may take them some time, but the fact that they know that they're in an environment, that they know that they are welcome sometimes might be just enough until they're ready to open up to you. Some examples of what you can put on your uptake forms might be to ask if a senior identifies as gay, lesbian, or bisexual. For sex or gender, you might add a third category. Now, this may cause some discomfort. Um, sometimes elders are very private in terms of wanting to share their information and that's okay and it's okay if they don't answer. What you're doing though is you're demonstrating that your organization is really aware of LGBT senior issues and historical and the history of LGBT senior issues. Uptake forms should include maybe partner rather than just spouse. By adding this you're also letting LGBT seniors know that their primary relationships and are respected, they're recognized, and they're valued. Place the information about your resources in their orientation packets. Also, don't assume the person's partner or spouse is male or female until you're told otherwise. Instead of asking, are you married? Maybe ask, are you in a relationship? Use LGBT friendly statements or images in some of your brochures, outreach materials have pictures of maybe same-sex couples or partners. Also, try advertising your services in LGBT press and LGBT organizations. 
lastly, I just want to talk a little bit. I know I've talked about some of the issues and some of the concerns, but I also want to highlight just the resiliency and I want to celebrate our LGBT seniors and everything that they've gone through and everything that I know that I, I learn every day in my work when they share their stories. I'm always honored to share and listen and hear their stories. It's important for both it's important really both inside and outside the LGBT community to recognize the resiliency of our LGBT seniors. All that they survived. To be able to love who they want. We talk about them paving the way for us. And they're the reason why we have the rights that we have now. It's important to create a safe space and provide for them. You know, train your staff on LGBT aging related issues. You can organize a diversity forum for the seniors you serve. It really sends a message that you welcome all seniors. Listen to their stories. <clears throat> I'm just in awe of some of the stories that community members have shared with me and their adventures and all that they've done and all that they overcame. Honor and respect them. Advocate for LGBT clients. You know, encourage LGBT, LGBT seniors to maybe prepare directives or, or find help in preparing directives, getting their, you know, answers to the questions they might have around wills and other important legal documents, just to ensure that their wishes will be honored. Also, I think we can also remain committed to continually advocating for LGBT elders so that we all can feel comfortable and respected as we age. As my client said earlier, age is Aging isn't for the faint of heart. I've also included just some additional resources for some of the material that I used today in the PowerPoint. And I just really want to thank Family Caregiver Alliance for the opportunity to allow me to present today. Also want to thank you to the audience who joined us today who do incredible work, medical providers, social workers, care navigators, geriatric care managers, business professionals, and caregivers who do a lot of work, and most of all, advocate, advocates for seniors. Thank you for all that you do and all the amazing work you do in service to seniors. Thank you. Perfect. Well, thanks so much, uh, Sylvia. Uh, you know, it is uh, National uh, Family Caregivers Month, so I was really happy that um, Sylvia was available. Um, very happy that uh, we could partner with uh, Open House for another project. Uh, you know, of course, we do know that you know the LGBT community is uh, diverse, uh, demographically, uh, ethnically, um, and diffuse, and so that's why we thought it'd be. Uh, a really, a, a really great topic to be able to share some information um, with people uh, in the Bay Area but across the country about this topic. So uh, I guess we have some time for questions, so I think we'll get right into it. Uh, first question, oh, here, I guess I'll, I'll ask a first question. So you know, I, I like to think that um, people, you know, healthcare providers, medical professionals, uh, try to do the right thing. They, you know, they want to you know, do the best and be good neighbors. But um, you know, sometimes intent and, and uh, how it's how it um, how it's received, how it's perceived, might not always match up. So I was wondering if you could just give some examples of maybe uh, statements that maybe might seem innocuous to people who are maybe not so uh, uh, not so knowledgeable about the LGBT community, but might come off as as maybe hurtful uh, or um, hurtful or, or uh, painful to hear from someone in the uh, the community. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's um, really, really important um, because the experiences that LGBT elders have had either early on in their lives dealing with medical providers and things like that where there wasn't that sensitivity um, has really, it's very painful. Um, I know that from my own personal experience and the work that I do, I've gone on many medical escorts uh, accompanying community members uh, to visit a doctor and you know just seeing sometimes the fear that they have when they go into the room and just really wanting someone there present with them not knowing what to expect and I know we've come a long way in terms of you know medical providers and staff are really doing a lot more to really understand and acknowledge and respect the LGBT community or folks from just different cultures or different backgrounds um, when we talk about 
you know, instead of saying, you know, like when we talk about things that could be insensitive, is making those assumptions, you know, as medical providers, we just really never want to make assumptions, you know, asking, you know, is your husband out in the waiting room um, for men? Is your wife, does your wife know you're here? Or do you have, you know, who, you know who's supporting you at home? And, I, and just assuming that it, I guess looking at it from a heterosexual perspective um, and just kind of removing ourselves out of that. I think even LGBT people do that as well. We live in an, what we feel sometimes a heterosexual environment and so sometimes we can also internalize that as well but never making assumptions about who that person loves or who's there to support that person or if they maybe they don't have someone there to support them but their best friend is their family member and to acknowledge that and say you know what maybe they'd like to come and join you because it sounds like there's someone that's really really close to you and we want to make sure that they hear all the information too so when you go home together they can help care for you and just being really open and really just not making assumptions. And it's okay to ask uh, maybe someone who identifies as transgender, you know, how you know how would you like to be identified or how would you know in terms of pronoun and, and honoring that. I think asking those questions in a way that's respectful is really helpful. And it really sends a message to that individual that the person's taking the time to get to know me um, oftentimes it's hard. I know medical providers don't have a lot of time, but a little bit goes a long way. Somebody once told me kindness matters. Great, thank you. Actually, we you know we had a actually um, that's great advice and just the at the the part about asking actually we we had a a, um, a support group not too long ago where that exact issue came up and we're trying to um, I know there's the issue of trying to be respectful and you know wanting to make sure that, you know, everyone is comfortable and, and how to, you know, go about it the correct way. Um, here's a good question. Uh, this is actually about privacy. How would you, um, how might service providers reassure, um, say, an LGBT older client that their medical and health information is going to remain private, especially, you know, knowing that they've gone through this, this history of discrimination and, you know, they have this additional, um, you know, a whole additional layer of privacy that they're really trying to, you know, uh, that they're really trying to maintain. Well, that's a really good question. We encounter this even it, in our organization where, you know, uh, LGBT older folks feel may not want to maybe sign off on their release. Uh, they may feel uncomfortable about that. And it's something that, you know, we really try to be real delicate and really patient and really explain. I think taking the time to really explain to clients how their information may be used by your agency. Um, also, who may or may not be able to access that information. Also, you know, don't force clients to give answers with regards to sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, these are some suggestions. I think a lot of it is to just really be reassuring and, and to be patient and to just understand that for some folks, you know, they've signed things before and bad things have happened. Negative things have happened, especially around health care and things like that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people, you know, once, uh, a lot of times if you, you know, kind of take the mystery out of things, if you just explain, kind of take exactly, as you mentioned, explain, you know, how things are being used, how to ex explain what's going on, then they, it does give them, um, a lot of reassurance that they, they kind of now understand, you know, a little bit more about that. Um, here's um, okay. Here's another good question. You talked about, uh, the, I guess, the challenges about uh, LGBT caregivers, and so our listener wanted to know uh, if you knew of any surveys or research that are um, studying these particular uh, challenges in the LGBT community. Challenges around um, care for caregivers. Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, there is. There's, uh, it's been limited, but there is some st some work being done. Um, and I believe the the author's last name is Kuhn, C O O N, and he talks about some interventions um, that can assist, you know, caregivers in terms of some of the stress that they face and, and some of the what they're dealing with and some of the lack of supports. Um, and that's a that is actually as a report that I read not too long ago. But the gentleman's last name is Kuhn, and um, he's done some really good work. I believe the model he 
calls, I believe it's called the SURE2 model. Um, so it's really around interventions to help support caregivers, LGBT caregivers. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, let's see. Okay, uh, how about this one? So, you know, we, um, there's, there's been, of course, a lot of, a lot of movement uh, uh, on the legislative front, um, marriage equality, things like that. I was wondering uh, if you could give maybe a, a brief update, maybe on what um, kind of these new legal, uh, uh, what's been going on in the legal front with uh, LGB elders, elders and caregivers, because I, you know, I know with you know in marriage equality, in, in theory, it should, uh, you know, a lot of things should, should be changing for the better. But um, if you could maybe talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, you know, it's um, yes, some mon monumental changes taking place. Uh, with DOMA and marriage equality. Um, you know, the thing of it is that that's at the federal level, so it's really, really important for caregivers and recipients of care to really do some fact-finding at the state level because some of the state rights and laws may vary or may differ from the federal level. And unfortunately, some states may or may not honor them, so I really recommend service providers in order to find additional information especially about some of the recent updates because it's ever moving, ever changing. Um, you know, there's also two transgenders laws and rights and ramifications. I would recommend um, going to National Center for Lesbian Rights, uh, the NCLR. Also utilizing National Resource Center on LGBT aging um, or Lambda Legal and of course Family Caregiver Alliance. And with such things, it's always good to probably if, especially around legal documents and things like that, finding out things about on Social Security or Medicare or Medi-Cal in California, Medicaid, as it's known across the rest of the United States, it's always good to, you know, either speak with uh, legal support or some of these organizations around specific issues related to that individual because it could be different different situation different scenarios thank you um, and actually I had a you know talking about um, I guess about these legal issues I, I had a question I, I remember you mentioned that um, a lot of uh, LGBT elder adults don't have any kind of um, um, wills or advanced directives or any of these other kind of legal documents um, especially I guess since they um, well, maybe it's, it is changing with uh, marriage equality, but especially because there are so many uh, sticky legal challenges, it seems like with, um, you know, uh, uh, families of origin versus families of choice and who are making decisions and these, you know, very, very important decisions. Uh, do you have any idea why? Uh, and I know, of course, this is, this is a, a, in general, a lot of people uh, don't fill these out, but is there, um, do you have any ideas on why they don't, um, more LGBT elders don't fill out these legal documents? Um, these kind of uh, end of life, you know, end of care kind of uh, documents? Yeah, you know, I think it could be, there could be many layers to that. I think in general, I think seniors in general, you know, dealing, talking about end of life, talking about death and dying and what have you is always a very difficult subject. You know, uh, we know it's inevitable, some, but sometimes looking at that, but setting that aside, I think too, you know, there's really a uh, LGBT elders is a lack of advocacy, you know, and just speaking from my own personal experience working with elders, and because I do, I'll have our elders when we go to the friendly visitor program, we have them fill out some information, and we do ask that question, and I would say most say no, um, but I wonder often if it's, you know, there's not someone advocating them, advocating for them or encouraging them, you know, of the importance of that. But often, too, a lot of our elders, they live alone. They live in isolation. And some of them, you know, again, it goes back to just some of the barriers that LGBT elders faced, you know, whether it was jobs, security, whether it was upward mobility, things like that. Oftentimes, or they may just not really think about that. Or if they do, you know, it's not something that they may not even know how to go about doing. That's what we do at Open House, too. We also provide workshops around financial planning, around documents and things like that. And generally, these workshops are packed. So, it, it, and I think if you're providing a safe space for people to feel welcome to be able to ask those questions and to get those help, 
that kind of help, that it will make a difference. But I think there's just a lot of different, maybe just a lot of different layers of, of why that is. Thanks. Um, okay. So, you know, I, um, this, uh, this is actually talking about the, um, the welcoming spaces. So, so, you know, you mentioned that the uh, kind of a non-discrimination policy, uh, you mentioned the language, uh, maybe a diverse, um, maybe a diverse staff. Are there, um, do you have any other suggestions or ideas on creating kind of a safe, uh, safe and respectful space? Sure. You know, we're very fortunate. Our offices, of course, are located in the LGBT center, so the moment anyone walks through the door, you know, it's uh, a, feeling, a feeling of welcoming space. But I think that um, there are other, also other ways that you can make it welcoming and it not have to be in uh, an LGBT center. I've worked in different organizations, and some of the things that we've done is um, maybe just as simple as putting a rainbow sticker or maybe rainbow-colored items or utilizing um, the safe zone signs, which really what that does, it signifies LGBT solidarity and acceptance. Also to, if at all possible, uh, providing gender neutral single stall bathrooms. Um, how about maybe displaying copies of LGBT relevant magazines, um, some of the publications, um, information, uh, centered around that, maybe marketing materials too. Um, you know, having LGBT older adults and older adults of color displayed on some of the material. I mean, that really sends a, a huge welcoming, a, just huge welcoming presence with that. Perfect. Thanks. You know, I think we have time for uh, two more questions. Uh, this next one is actually from a, uh, a Family Caregiver Alliance uh, staff member of one of our coworkers. So, you know, as part of, uh, and I think this would be uh, useful to a lot of organizations, but, you know, uh, Family Caregiver Alliance does have, um, we have, we have forums and, you know, kind of, we have intake forums and, and other, um, other um, materials that we use when, when uh, first interacting with clients, but do you have any advice on how we could make those more uh, inclusive and uh, welcoming to, uh, well, for us, for LGBT caregivers, so in terms of, you know, um, reflecting that, um, that respect and that, that, oh, that, uh, kind of, you know, making, making them more um, um, welcoming. Yeah, you know, I think, um, you know, the paperwork is the first thing often that someone who comes in for assistance, always intake, a registration form, it's kind of like your ticket into the services. We all, we all, you know, it's a way of also being able to kind of see who's coming to us for support and then how might we best support them. So, you know, I always look at that, and I always, when I say convey it to whoever's coming and seeking services, that, you know, this is going to, this helps us to, you know, help you in a better fashion. Um, and really, sometimes it may seem, you know, when it comes to sexual orientation, gender identity, all that matters. Uh, again, they may not answer those questions, but by having it on your intake form, um, having questions related to, um, you know, even questions related to feeling comfortable in, uh, we have one question that we will ask, you know, do you feel connected to maybe the LGBT community? Um, do you access, you know, what, maybe asking questions about what type of services do you access? What type of community services do you access? Um, centered around that, just, just really find, try to find out if, if folks are accessing them, or in many cases, they're not. Um, you know, just really, really being open with the language and not making any assumptions that everybody's going to be able to check off those boxes. You know, sometimes having a box that says other and allowing them to decide how they want to identify, I think is also helpful. You know, having that ability for them to write in how they want to be perceived or how they want to identify also helps too. Perfect. Thank you. You know, I know, you know, certainly as, as an organization, FCA, we're always trying to, you know, uh, look for ways to improve and, and make sure we're reaching, you know, the, the widest audience and, and being, you know, and, and being really mindful of, of people's you know, differing experiences. So that's, uh, that's some really good advice. Uh, you know, and actually about the, um, you know, kind of the, the other or the kind of uh, the, um, 
the specify. I guess um, you know we'll we'll save this. Uh, I'll save this 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 question for the end. Uh, it's I guess about working you know with uh, transgender older adults, kind of what the best practices might be. Uh, it seems that um, you know maybe uh, uh, popular culture and kind of the you know the the general populace is is kind of starting to you know accept and wrap their heads around you know the the gay and the lesbian the bisexual, but they you know they might. Um, the transgender, they, they they might not know anyone or might have never seen someone who's transgender, and it might just be a little bit more of a, a head scratcher for people. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, we see it, um, you know, with I know with the recent um, with Bruce Jenner and what have you. It, uh, people are talking about it, but a lot of uh, folks may not know, you know, you know what's comfortable. I don't want to make anyone feel uncomfortable, so I think it's being sensitive and being. Uh, you know, practicing cultural humility is really important. You know, I think when it comes to maybe some best practices, um, you know, maybe training your staff um, to always know and maybe use the pronoun that their clients prefer. Um, services around maybe including shared rooms should be based on the client's gender identity and not his or her sex assigned at birth. Um, Things like it's really never appropriate to ask, what is your real name? Um, instead, if you need something like that, you might want to ask them, you know, can I make a copy of your insurance card? Um, and also you might, you, might be, you might say something like, ask if the name on the insurance card should be used for billing purposes. You know, it's really, uh, it's about maybe even also asking clients when arranging appointments, say, with other providers or on referrals, you know, what personal information that they, they're really comfortable discussing. The other thing is transgender folks should always be able to use whichever restroom aligns with their gender identities. And it's really about setting the tone of respect um, and that feeling of inclusiveness. I know our transgender folks, um, they deal with a lot of discrimination, a lot of violence. Um, even though someone like Bruce Jenner can come out and we can honor that person, there's still a lot of violence that we hear about on a daily basis about trans women of color. So, you know, being aware from that, we just really read it need to recommit ourselves. Not only we have these great laws that have been passed, but we need to continue to, to commit ourselves to really advocating for our, our trans brothers and sisters. Perfect. Thanks so much. Well, I think, you know, that's uh, all the time we have now for questions. You could always uh, give uh, Family Caregiver Alliance a call um, or actually contact um, Sylvia at Open House. Sylvia, would you mind providing your uh, information just uh, for the listeners one last time? Absolutely. Thank you so much. And uh, please call me with any questions. I'm, I'd love to hear from you. Um, my email address is Sylvia, S-Y-L-V-I-A, at openhouse dash sf dot o-r-g and our number at open house is area code 415-296-8995 and I can be reached at extension 303. Perfect, thanks. And uh, does open house, do they actually do any um, trainings? Do they lead trainings or do they uh, advise others in uh, some of this uh, information? Absolutely, uh, we do. We offer cultural competency training. Um, our director of programs, Michelle Halcedo, and many of our staff have taught thousands and thousands of providers. Uh, we can come to you. We also have in-service at Open House. We are very happy and very eager to help your staff, help you in terms of becoming more culturally aware of some of the folks you might be serving, especially LGBT elders. Perfect. Well, thanks so much. Um, you know, now that the webinar is wrapping up, I feel like in, uh, I, I can I uh, can disclose, but this is um, Sylvia's actual first webinar, so I, m I must say she handled it much much better than uh, uh, my first webinar. I was, I was pretty nervous, um, but anyways, we're we're really happy to have her here on, on National Caregiver Month, um, representing Open House, and you know, kind of all the experience she brings. Um, so thanks again, Sylvia, for being Thank with us. Thank you. Thank you, Calvin. Thank you, Family Caregiver Alliance, and thank you, folks. So uh, our next webinar is December 9. Uh, that's going to be called uh, Keeping Your Family Member Moving and Engaged. 
so they can remain at home. That will be um, hosted by, or that will be uh, presented by Cindy uh, Cardiman, and you can visit our website for more information about that webinar. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Sylvia. Thanks, Calvin. The webinar is now concluded. We hope to see you all next month, and uh, have a great uh, Turkey Day. <laughs>